Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here this morning and participating in this meeting and to be on the podium with such distinguished colleagues and leaders in healthcare today. Uh, I love that quote, and it's a nice, it's a nice uh, transition in some ways to what I hope to talk about as well. Um, we know how essential translational research is for the health of individuals and for the public health more broadly in this nation and around the world. And I think that this conversation that really looked at the spectrum uh, that's needed from, from fundamental research through to reimbursement, including the regulatory process, um, is a very important framework for thinking about how do we really realize the fruits of research today. FDA has long played an important role in driving the innovation of new biomedical products. Indeed, as a regulatory and public health agency, FDA is in a unique position to facilitate the development of innovative products while always maintaining a commitment to safety and effectiveness. As Francis has so eloquently outlined, this is a critical moment for us all to work together to deliver innovations and practical strategies to improve health. Today, we're investing more than ever before in biomedical research and development to the tune of about $80 billion last year from the public and private sectors. These efforts are clearly vital for medical progress, and we've witnessed the resultant discoveries that hold major promise for new and improved therapeutics in fields as diverse as genomics, systems biology, synthetic biology, um, advanced therapies like stem cells, and emerging technologies like nanotechnology. But right now, I think we can all acknowledge that we're failing to translate these breakthrough discoveries and innovation into benefits for people as effectively as we would hope. In fact, the number of submissions to the FDA of new molecular entities is on the decline. Correspondingly, the number of new approved therapies is on the decline, while the costs of bringing these new therapies to the market have actually soared. For the biomedical research community, not to mention the pharmaceutical and biotech industry, this is frustrating and disappointing. For healthcare providers and for patients, it's even worse. To put it simply, there's a troubling and unacceptable gap between advances in science and patient care, and we need to close that gap to get to the other side of Francis's bridge and to do it more swiftly and more surely, and we can. Realistically, to do so will require attention to many factors, but in my view, one key element involves the advancement and more effective application of regulatory science, the science and tools needed to assess and evaluate a product's safety, efficacy, quality, and performance. It involves the development of new methods, standards, and models that we can use to speed the development, review, approval, and the ongoing oversight of medical products. A bench scientist may develop a new approach to a disease, a clinician may be able to show that it can work, but regulatory scientists must help develop the knowledge and tools to translate discovery and innovation into those products that hold so much promise. We cannot take full advantage of the breakneck speed of biomedical research unless we also emphasize innovation in regulatory science. Just as biomedical research has evolved over the past few decades, regulatory science must also evolve in important and in powerful ways. Regulatory science is, in my view, an essential part of the overall scientific enterprise, yet it's been underappreciated, underfunded, and underdeveloped. Because of this, we've been unable to apply the best possible science and technology to the tasks before us, and we're left sometimes relying on 20th century approaches for the review, approval, and oversight of the treatments and cures of the 21st century. So now is clearly the time to move forward. A robust field of regulatory science will allow us to effectively and efficiently translate many of these opportunities into therapies and cures. It can enable us to use our knowledge of biological pathways and gene variants to help define which drug candidates will work better and for whom. 
It will foster the use of advanced genetic data and biomarkers to find faster paths to disease targets. It will support efforts to optimize clinical trial design to speed the regulatory process and get products to patients faster. Without advances in regulatory science, promising therapies may be discarded during development because we lack the tools to recognize their potential and because outdated inefficient review methods unnecessarily delay the approval of critical treatments. On the other hand, both significant dollars and many years may be wasted assessing a novel therapy that with better tools might be shown to be unsafe or ineffective at an earlier stage. I should emphasize that regulatory science comprises an array of disciplines and approaches. It takes place in laboratories, but it also involves clinical, epidemiologic, and statistical tools, as well as technologies such as bioimaging and IT for information gathering and data mining systems. It, in fact, is embedded in much of the work that all of you do. And with regulatory science, unlike work performed by specific sponsors, Regulatory science is important for multiple products and stakeholders. The knowledge generated from such studies informs a whole body of innovation rather than a single product. Advancing the field of regulatory science has enormous importance to FDA, but it is much broader. It is really about fostering a key area of opportunity so that we can harness the possibilities of science today and bridge that critical gap between discovery and real-world products for people who need them. And that's why I've made advancing regulatory science on behalf of public health a critical priority for our agency. Over the past two years, we've been building out our regulatory science initiative and devoting time and resources to leading the effort to identify areas that are ripe for strategic, targeted investments that can make a real and lasting difference. This includes, of course, strengthening the science base at FDA but we're focusing even more on building the partnerships across government and with academia, industry, and the nonprofit community that will drive the development of innovative medical products and the delivery of better, safer products to the American people. You just heard about the NIH FDA Regulatory Science Initiative, and this is, I think, a very, very important example of what we are doing and lays out a pathway for so much more that can be done we have made some important uh, grants as a first step, and we hope to be making another set of grants, um, doing another um, grant cycle very soon. And of course, the FDA NIH Leadership Council uh, really is, is very, very important in laying out a research agenda to work on together uh, to really make sure that the, the regulatory requirements of research and development are integrated early on and that we address key areas of need. And this year, now that we actually do have a budget, um, and I can't tell you how long we've been waiting, um, we hope to begin to establish some centers of excellence in regulatory science, uh, most likely housed in academic institutions and focused on important research in the field. Real success will depend on all of us working together and bringing the best minds and expertise to the table. But the possibilities can be tremendous. So let me now do three specific examples in the areas of biomarkers, toxicology, and data assessment, try to illustrate some targeted areas where advances in regulatory science are needed to improve health and health care. First, biomarkers. Important work is underway with respect to the identification, characterization, and qualification of biomarkers for regulatory use, and it's beginning to have dramatic impacts. For example, we need this regulatory science to help us usher in the era of personalized medicine. Through such work, we can optimize targeted delivery and dosing of drugs and therapies so that patients can receive the most benefit with the lowest risk. Yet despite all the advances in understanding the human genome, we only have about 30 validated biomarkers associated with product labeling right now, but we really certainly expect to see much more in this arena. Notably also, working with many academic partners and others, we're increasingly using regulatory science and the search for biomarkers to develop the future of cancer treatments and other important therapies targeted in a much more personalized way. As you well know, 
Research studies are identifying potential tumor markers that can indicate whether a patient's cancer will respond to a specific therapy or combination of therapies. But for these markers to be applied in clinical practice, we must use this new science to guide the assessment of subpopulations of responders and the evaluation and use of new diagnostic tests in that context. And so that's why we've really been deeply engaged in a number of partnerships to jumpstart these efforts, including working with the Foundation uh, for NIH, um, the Biomarkers Consortium, uh, which is searching for and validating new biological markers to accelerate the delivery of successful new technologies for the prevention, early diagnosis, and treatment of disease. I thought that perhaps uh, Francis actually was going to talk about the iSPY2 trial, um, which represents a groundbreaking new clinical a groundbreaking new clinical trial model that builds on new understandings uh, in biomarkers. It's an adaptive clinical trial design. Um, developed uh, using regulatory science that will help scientists quickly and efficiently test the most promising drugs in development for women with higher risk, rapidly growing breast cancers. I want to mention that this kind of adaptive clinical trial is also part of a broader rethinking about how we do clinical research that's needed to test new approaches for a range of conditions. Going forward, we must increasingly develop and implement new clinical trial methodologies and other analytics that can balance methodologic rigor with the need for more rapid answers, more targeted answers, and often smaller study populations. I also want to mention briefly exciting work using novel biomarkers to advance preclinical toxicity studies. This is important because I think, as you know, unfortunately, many new drug candidates often fail late in development after significant investments of time and money have been made. So there's a real advantage to identifying potential safety concerns before human studies are performed. And in recent years, FDA has led uh, several collaborative efforts and worked with our sister regulatory agencies um, to identify and qualify novel biomarkers for detecting drug-induced kidney toxicity in preclinical animal, animal models and we've now qualified a number of biomarkers uh, for use in this arena, which is, is, you know, really making it possible to detect early those, those candidates that will fail. And also these markers may prove to be an effective monitoring tool for kidney toxicity uh, in human studies as well. Um, I realize I'm going a little long, so um, so much to talk about is, and so much that I want to convey. Let me talk about the next um, major area of strategic investment, and it builds on what I was just mentioning, and that is toxicology. Again, here we have an important collaboration uh, with, with NIH um, that I also was hoping Francis would talk about, the Tox21 project. But Really, this is a critical moment to look at, at how we advance the area of toxicology because despite all of what's been going on in modern safety science today, far too many of the toxicology tools used for regulatory assessment have relied on high-dose animal studies and default extrapolation procedures and have remained relatively unchanged for decades despite the scientific revolutions of the past half century. Such testing is costly and time-consuming and doesn't always provide results that reliably correlate with human responses. So clearly, we need better predictive models to identify concerns earlier in the product development process and to target efforts more effectively. This requires development and validation of methods that are reliable in predicting safety and other product attributes. Advances in life sciences and engineering have the potential to dramatically change the way toxicology assessments are performed, but these new technologies have not yet been sufficiently studied or tested, and investments in regulatory science today can help seed a revolutionary change in toxicology and hazard assessment going forward. This is extremely important to our work at FDA, and we've made modernizing toxicology one of our key scientific priorities in our emerging science and innovation strategic plan. And as part of our efforts to strengthen science at FDA, 
reviewers and staff throughout the agency have been and will continue to be educated and trained in the latest and best ways to conduct such safety assessments. And we're continuing to try to build out scientific knowledge in these key areas. And we have been um, trying through uh, grant making on a small scale to support research into innovative methodologies uh, in these areas, including a recent RFA on reproductive and developmental toxicology. Another major area in which we're investing our regulatory science resources is in understanding how to better leverage FDA's enormous collection of data. We house the largest known repository of clinical data, unique, high-quality data on safety, efficacy, and performance of drugs, biologics, and devices, both before and after approval. But despite the availability of these data, really important questions about both drugs and diseases remain unanswered. FDA data could be used to address fundamental questions about patient subsets who respond in varying ways to new therapies or for whom a drug is more or less safe, placebo control effects, disease progression from control group data, the safety of a product once it's in use, comparative effectiveness research, and many more areas of possible research endeavor. But we lack the right infrastructure, tools, and resources to organize and analyze these large data sets across the multiple studies and data streams. In other words, we have a valuable library full of information, but we don't have the indices or tools for translation. Mining the FDA data is complicated, both uh, strategically and technically, and because records must be kept confidential. There are additional complexities of commercial confidential information as well. And it goes without saying that any progress in this arena must take place with the full cooperation of industry and that we will in no way compromise confidential commercial information. Still, the potential is enormous, and I believe that FDA and industry need to define strategies for working in this context. And to this end, FDA has been investing in the infrastructure necessary to support receipt of study data electronically and develop an environment conducive to analyses of large data sets. These types of analyses could not only enhance review by applying lessons learned from one study to another, but more broadly provide valuable information about diseases and therapies along with unprecedented insight into the mechanisms that govern their successes or failures. These insights will benefit FDA, will benefit industry, and will benefit the biomedical and healthcare community at large. Importantly, they will benefit patients, and they will enable physicians to make more informed decisions about the optimal use of FDA-regulated products. So I think I need to wind up. It's very exciting to be at FDA at this moment. It's really a chance to engage with the broader scientific research community in new and important ways to strengthen the science at FDA so that we can more effectively and efficiently review the products that come before us so that we work, can work in partnership with CMS early on to think about the products that are moving through the pipeline and provide the best possible information about benefits and risks. So it's exciting to be here this morning. Clearly, I have uh, lots that I want to talk about, but it's also wonderful to be able to hear 